We are very honored to have with us today Leon Wieseltier. Um, Leon is the editor of Liberties. He was the longtime literary editor of the New Republic. Um, I've been reading Leon since I was 19 years old. And so he's been extremely influential in my thinking. And um, I know Monica's thinking as well. Monica, um, why don't you start off with the questions? Sure, happy to. Um, and again, Leon, congratulations again on the success of Liberties. It's, uh, Thank you, you know, as, as, as I've said, it's truly a light uh, in contemporary discourse that we need so much right now. Thank you. Um, so I wanna start uh, with something that, that isn't light. Uh, I wanna start with the idea of exile. Uh, it's you know, it's something that I think about a lot. Um, you know, I think that as Jews, the idea of exile is something that is, um, you know, it's a very intricate part of Jewish identity, of Jewish narratives, of Jewish stories. Um, but I also think exile has come to mean something a little different in the past few years. Um, and of course, you have come out of your own exile. Um, so I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about this idea of exile and what it what it's like to come out of exile in in a world in which, you know, what, what some people call cancel culture, um, you know, is full of people trying to persistently and repeatedly exile people based on something they may or may not have done. Uh, what can I say? I'm not glad it happened, but I'm not poorer for it. Uh, it in the Jewish tradition, as you know, exile was always regarded punitively as a punishment. <clears throat> and there is a view that all of contemporary exile is also punitive for sins that various people, usually men, um, have committed. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, the assumption is that the punishment is deserved, that the exile is just. In our society right now, the situation is much more complicated, much more complicated. Um, my own view always was that, that there were important corrections in male behavior towards women in certain environments in this country that needed to be made. And my view always was that 20 years ago, um, I tried to kiss a colleague for which I apologized. But having said those things, I will also say that um, what doesn't need to be reformed, politicized, puritanized, and so on, are relations between men and women generally, which are much bigger than any and deeper than any particular ideology or particular movement. Um, and we have become, as a consequence of these changes, an unbelievably unforgiving society. Uh, I, you know, I came out of this sometimes thinking that the only thing I can no longer forgive is unforgivingness. Uh, we, um, we are operating with a model of behavior. And of course, I'm not talking about the most egregious cases, which are obvious and are not even interesting for that reason. Uh, but there is, we are operating with an ideal of purity of character, of um, impeccable behavior, of perfect pasts, of sinless people. I, I left my, my shul, my synagogue, because I thought that they treated me very unfairly during my adventure. And I remember one day saying to the rabbi that I didn't know until now, after 22 years in the synagogue, that the whole time I'd been praying in a congregation of saints, of tzaddikim. Um, people are flawed, people are fragile. Things that are viewed as aggressions are often just misunderstandings. Uh, 
there are life is so much more complicated than the picture that we're being presented of it. And um, you know, the I was delighted by my return from exile because I returned to start a journal that uh, I think is significant in its way in the conversation. Well, I, the conversation is the wrong metaphor in the great national shouting match. Um, but it was it was interesting for someone like myself to to experience what pariahdom was like. I mean, I had spent decades in the white hot center of things uh, by choice, um, by luck, uh, and all of a sudden there was nowhere to go, nowhere to work, no salary, nothing. Uh, I used to joke that. That one, you know, that I was pre-COVIDed, uh, which is, and the irony was that when everybody or many people lost their salaries in their offices, I got mine, and we started Liberties. Um, but it is interesting to see the world from the margins, and to watch the behavior of people from the margins. You learn a lot, not just about who your friends are and who your friends aren't. But you learn a lot about uh, social conformity. You learn about a lot about righteousness. You learn a lot about uh, many of the things that the Jewish tradition actually warns against about instantly siding with the majority. You learn a lot about the importance of being done, of giving people the benefit of the doubt. You learn a lot about the need to dissent. Uh, there were so many times during my exile when uh, various uh, dicta in our tradition suddenly spoke to me in a new way. Um, so as I say, I wish it hadn't happened. It was interesting, and I'm not the poorer for it. So obviously this, what, what you went through, and by the way, I'm glad you're back. I mean, oh, we, especially you. in this current intellectual environment, we need your voice now more than ever. Um, so, you, sure. Um, so obviously what you went through speaks to um, the larger ideological environment they're in. How would you describe this current ideological moment? Um inflamed to the point of derangement. I think that, um, look, I, I think that I'm not, I'm not one of those people who, who worry about polarization as much as other people do. I, our system was designed for polarization, for conflict. The, the, the premise of the founding fathers was that conflict was a permanent feature of human affairs. And we don't have any Rousseauist fantasy of perfect social unanimity, of a general will, or of total consensus. So I don't mind the fights, and some of them are certainly about primary differences, philosophical differences, moral differences. I think what has happened is that partly as a consequence of real crisis, of economic and social crisis, of the insane magnitude of inequality in our country, of the fact that uh, American cops just keep shooting black people for some reason that I don't entirely understand. Um, so as a consequence of crisis, but also for cultural reasons and other reasons, we have agreed to simplify ourselves and to regard not just other people, but also ourselves as just one thing. Uh, you know, when people talk about identity, the singular of that word is, is, is an illusion. We have identities in the plural. And what we mean by identity is that attribute of identity that we have chosen to emphasize. It's the one we want to be known by. And people are making choices that distort the nature of human experience and the nature of human psychology. Uh, so we have 
pared ourselves down into representatives of groups. Uh, we have conferred upon emotion a political and cultural prestige that it does not deserve. The other word for that is populism. Uh, and of course the preferred emotion is anger, which is now regarded as a good thing, not a bad thing. In fact, it's regarded as a, a badge of commitment. If you're not angry, you're not in the fight. We have made all kinds of decisions as a society and as a culture about what we want to be like as individuals and as communities. And I think this is poison almost everything, almost everything. Um, and by the way, all I don't know any group or community in America that is not guilty of these distortions and exaggerations. Uh, you know, I mean, Ambrose Bierce famously defined impiety as your contempt for my God. And I'm not saying that. We're, I mean, the, everybody has fallen into the trap of this, these hot-headed particularisms. And it's, it's painful to watch. It's very, very sad. We talk a lot about the role of, some would call it woke ideology in the current environment. To what degree do you attribute it to this ideology, which has sort of spread in society? To what degree do you think this is in equal measures on all sides of the political spectrum that there's a sort of a larger ailment in society? Um, look, we know from the history of ideology that I, ideology was designed to, to deny the complexity of situations, to provide one key to all the locks. So to give you the answer to all the questions and the more intensely ideological a period is, the more intellectually simple and culturally tendentious it's going to be, which is the way we're living now. Um, I think that uh, woke ideology has, well, let's say what we mean by, uh, what I regard by woke ideology it are not, is not the actual substance of various claims that are made about American history, about gender relations, racial relations, and so on. We can debate those claims. Some of them have merit, some of them do not. Uh, by woke ideology, I mean this ruthless pressure to conform. That's the thing that, that, that troubles me the most. This, this, um, this inquisitorial mentality that, that examines everybody's past to make sure that it is stainless. Uh, and if it is not, that attempts to delegitimate them publicly. Uh, that, ha that is a mode of behavior and a mode of pseudo-intellectual argument that has a long and very nasty history. Uh, the, the provenance of that mentality is not exactly glorious. And that worries me enormously because people are being stifled. And when they're not being stifled, they're being intimidated. I mean, they're being inhibited. You know, all this, it's not, it has an enormous chilling effect. It shouldn't require courage in a free country to say what one believes. We shouldn't have to need qualities of personal heroism to state what happened to be our sincerely held opinions. Those opinions may be wrong, but we have to remember that there are worse things in life than being wrong. There really are. Uh, and so this whole constellation, this cluster of attitudes about about what is permitted and what isn't permitted and that somebody somewhere has the right to give permission or withdraw permission uh, and that all the, this, this troubles me obviously enormously. Not only me, it troubles many people. Uh, you know, I started my journal because I wanted to open up 
a genuinely independent space. There are conservatives, liberals, and progressives in my pages. All of them believe in the larger liberal compact about what, what discourse in a free society should be like. Some of them disagree with each other. I also wanted to open a space that was independent of the um, demented brevity and velocity of social media so that people could actually write out all their thoughts and we can have informed and analytical and knowledgeable arguments about things and not just trade curses on Twitter or get it down to 700 words for the times. Um, so what, what I tried to do is, you know, I looked around, this is by the way, an answer to your question, not just a plug. Um, I looked around and saw what was missing, uh, at least what was missing for me. And I wasn't surprised to discover that it was missing for many of my comrades and other people and um, tried to provide an address for this kind of discourse. Uh, I'm not on social media myself. It's, you know, if I, there were two or three things I've done in my life that when I get to the pearly gates and I'm asked for reasons to be led into heaven, I will be admitted. And one of them is that I'll be able to say with a good conscience that I was never on social media. Um, you know, I'm completely virginal in this regard, um, <laughs> only in this regard, but in this regard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I looked around and I saw, well, what don't we have here? And what did we once have that we don't have anymore? You know, in, in a democratic society, we govern ourselves by, by, by tallying our opinions. We call those opinions votes. And that being the case, the quality, the intellectual quality of our opinions uh, matters enormously because that, th those are the things by which we govern ourselves. And so it's not just the substance of what we think, it's actually why we believe what we believe and do we agree that others can dispute it and are we willing to make our beliefs open to public scrutiny and so on. And so that being the case, the quality of our opinion formation becomes the key to democracy really. And I looked around at how our opinions are formed now and it, you know, it breaks one's heart. And so that's my long answer to, uh, to how I think about the decline of intellectual and political discourse in our country. So Leon, what you're describing here is a, a very distressing scenario. It is. And, right, and I, I think that um, on one hand, so much of it speaks to the power of the binary, right? Which is, yeah. as you suggested, what ideologies always hinge on, right? And we're, we're, we're in a place right now where, you know, we don't wanna be right, wrong. We wanna be right. Yeah. You're either right or you're wrong. Well, we're and a Manichaean society, right? Exactly, exactly. And um, it, it's not just that we're unaware of or forgotten or, or dismissed nuance. I think we've outright rejected it. And, you know, we're becoming more and more of a divisive society. Um, it reminds me of there was a podcast that you did with someone a while back where you talked about how there are no good people or bad people. There are only good people who sometimes behave in very good or very bad ways. And I that's what I remember have. that. Yes. I think that's a very important point, even if I said it myself. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, if, if only bad people were responsible for bad deeds, life would be extremely interesting easy to understand. The reason life is so hard to understand is because bad things are sometimes done by good people and for good purposes. And so there's a great deal of confusion and anger and debate. Um, there's a confusion between reasons on, and motives, which are not the same thing. Um, as I said earlier, I think we need to complicate our analysis of the individual, of the person. Uh, I think that um, 
individuals are being absorbed into the larger and increasingly airless communitarianisms of both sides um, so that you are only a representative of your group. And if you, uh, and, that, and that is the preferred way of viewing someone. When you speak, you speak for your group. And if you speak only for yourself, then in some way you, you have defected from your group. You may be disloyal to your group. Uh, you, you, you may be a heretic. Um, you know, in a secular society, we, we shouldn't need heretics to advance the argument. Uh, but again, as I said earlier, everything has gotten so fraught that um, the stakes are so high in every expression of opinion because, you know, again, you're either on, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. <clears throat> we've had an earlier, we've had many earlier episodes of this kind of um, ideological zero sumness about things. Um, yeah, I th you know there is, you know, it must be said that we are a Manichaean society. But two, there are two positive developments. One is that there is a saving remnant of liberals still around, uh, and by liberals I don't mean progressives, even though they often vote for the same presidential candidate. They are not the same persuasion. Um, but there are such people, they are being shouted down. And also it is an old article of faith, both on the traditional left and not traditional right, that above all kill the liberals. Um, because the left and the right can live with each other quite happily. They batten mm -hmm. off each other all the time. But the liberals, they break the rules of the game. And it's they're, they're, they're incredibly either irritating or dangerous, depending on how you act. Anyway, there is a saving remnant. And also, I think there are more and more people among, among on the left, on the right, in the center. I don't know where any, what, what the names are anymore. But there are more and more people who have come to realize that the regimentation of opinion and the prestige in our culture of this regimentation mm. of opinion. Because you know what matters in a culture is not just what is, but whether or not you value it relative to other things in the culture, what you emphasize or italicize. And the prestige of this regimentation of opinion has gone too far for a lot of people. And you see it all the time. I mean, I mm. hear it all the time. It's not yet a politics, it's not yet a movement. The conservatives are hypocritically trying to co-opt it um, mm. so that the anti-woke has now become, you know, a talking point for, for, for redneck candidates in the South um, because everything gets coarsened in our conversation. Why not this too? Um, mm. But, uh, and so as is always the case, with liberals, there are enemies to the right and there are enemies to the left. And not everything to the left of the right is the same. And not everything to the left of the right is, is something that a liberal might feel comfortable with. So it's a very complicated time in this regard, but there's some hope for me in, um, in this increasing realization that too many thoughts and people are being stifled, um, dismissed, scorned, uh, never mind people who actually lose their livelihoods. Uh, because as you know, in our culture right now, if someone says something that certain communities don't like, the first response is to fire them, just to rob a person of his or her livelihood. Not the not the fifth response or the, you know, it, the first thing is impoverish them, exile them. Uh, and we need to think about this. Um, mm -hmm. So that's my long-winded answer to that. Mm -hmm. So I grew up um, probably as a lot of, similar to a lot of Jewish boys and probably some Jewish women arguing, constantly arguing. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, the arguments that we had when the New Republic 
decided to uh, publish the bell curve essay. Um, I mean, I think we, you know, we were at uh, nearly, you know, in a, in a fist fight over it. Well, um, just we argued about it too at the New Republic. I, I know, I know, and there were arguments about the arguments afterwards. I remember, um, and and so, you know, to me, that's how I learned, and um, and I I find this current intellectual environment almost an assault on that form of Jewish identity, if you want to call it that. It's, I, I call it sort of like Jewish debate culture, and um, and to what degree has the Jewish have in, in your view and what you've observed in this, has the Jewish community sort of succumbed to a discourse that wants to shut down a critical aspect of ourselves? That's a very good question. And uh, that's a very good question. There is, you know, one has to distinguish between genuine intellectual debate, which Jews pride themselves on as always having been characteristic of our culture, and Jewish quarrelsomeness, which was always an essential feature of our culture. Uh, sometimes I fear that we flatter ourselves too much in believing that, um, that we are, uh, that unlike other groups, we are in the middle of some high level debate about things. Uh, the Jewish community has also formed tribes. There are the sharks and there are the jets uh, among the Jews too. Uh, everybody has their favorite analysis of the Jewish community. Uh, I just learned, I, not to my surprise, though to my delight, that uh, I think Monica and I were talking about this, that there uh, that there has now there's about to be released a very impressive empirical quantitative study, and I rarely praise such things, but it's about to be released, which shows it's a deep study of opinions about Israel of American Jews, non-Orthodox American Jews under 30. And lo and behold, they are not all sick to death of Israel and alienated from Israel and ashamed of Israel. They're concerned about various things that are happening there. But the impression that the New York Times gives this week, or maybe it was that, that Zionism is over in America and support for Israel is over in America, there are changes happening that should concern American Zionists, but the war is not lost. It really isn't. And very frequently when you look at the Jewish debates, you also have a, a coarsening of discourse. You also have a coarsening of discourse. Um, I think also, and we know this from the history of the Jews in exile, every Jewish community in the diaspora takes on the characteristics of the host culture. And American Jews are no different. And we have been behaving in good ways and bad ways the way our non-Jewish brothers and sisters in America are conducting themselves. So I have um, I have misgivings about it. There's not a lot of intellectual courage in the American Jewish community. Uh, there really isn't. Um, people think that it takes an enormous amount of courage to suggest that the settlements of the West Bank are wrong. It doesn't. Um, they are wrong, by the way, but it doesn't take any courage to suggest that. Um, there is not a lot of courage in our community right now. I discovered that during my own recent adventure, uh, which is a subject, that's a subject of a whole other conversation. Hmm. I have another question, but if you wanna go for it, why don't you go ahead, Monica, and I'll come back okay. to mine. Um, so speaking of courage, you know, um, you know, I just keep thinking about, you know, what, what, what is the, direction or the trajectory for the Jewish community, um, you know, in this, this larger context that you've been speaking about. Um, you know, I just read your most recent essay in Liberties. I think it's titled exclamation. The exclamation point. Yes. Yeah. And, and their exclamation point. And there's one, there's one line here. I mean, there, there are a number of lines that are, um, 
you know, that, that pack a punch. But this one you write, but anti-Semitism does not particularly interest progressives because it interferes with too many of their dogmas. And it seems to me that this is, you know, one of the really big things that Jews are grappling with right now. And especially, um, you know, I'm from Los Angeles mm. and the Jewish community of Los Angeles is very much about social justice. It's a very progressive community. Um, but I think, you know, some people within the Jewish community are starting to realize that Jewish ideals are in many ways at odds with what you call the progressive dogma. So I'm, I'm just wondering wh where are we going? Where do, where do you see us headed? What is your, what, what, what do you think the trajectory looks like? For the community itself, for, for, for us? The Jewish community, for the Jewish community. How are we going to continue to be, you know, for, for those of us who might feel that we are progressives, you know, talk about taking on the characteristics of the yeah. host culture, obviously, you know, Jews in Los Angeles are very progressive, um, but yeah. they're, they're at odds with a lot of the ideals of the progressive movement. Um, well, I think the first thing that is required of them is intellectual honesty. And they all, and the second thing is to recognize that Judaism, Jewish civilization, the Jewish tradition, Jewishness, call it what you want, is neither liberal nor conservative nor progressive. It is what it is. Uh, the Jewish tradition is its own tradition. It contains many elements, obviously different Jewish individuals and groups tend to emphasize or italicize some of those elements more than others. But the first thing we need to retain our integrity as Jews is a very vivid knowledge of the tradition that makes us Jewish. Instead, what happens is Jews find their preferred ideological or political positions in the host culture, and then they go searching through various Jewish books to find rabbinical texts that support it. And that gives them a very toasty feeling of authenticity. They're going about it backwards. They're going about it backwards. So I begin with my tiresome, often stated assumption that what's most ailing American Jewish identity is ignorance. We don't know our traditions. We don't know our languages. We don't know anything. We think that 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 American that 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 the greatest avatar of American Jewishness in our time is Jerry Seinfeld. Um, it's really we, we are in a culturally and intellectually pathetic situation. Having said that, the resurgence of anti-Semitism in our time, and you have to be willfully blind to deny it. I mean, willfully blind. It's resurgence in America, in France, in England, in Germany, and, and in all kinds of places. Um, it's not Hitler. Um, I don't think that even uh, the Ayatollah Khamenei is Hitler. Hitler was very distinguished in his field. Mm -hmm. But um, we have, we're facing some very dangerous enemies. And any Jewish worldview that does that is not able to account for that fact will also not be able to protect us against our enemies and is therefore a very flawed worldview. Now, on the left, it's the strangest thing. We have been disqualified from intersectionality. It's some sort of great honor we have. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened at Mother Emanuel Church is exactly what happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue, exactly what happened. And somehow when the left recites its litany of victims, the Jews are not there because um, as Rosa Luxemburg famously wrote in a letter to her lover, she has a place in her heart for a wide variety of nationalities and she listed them and she said, but she has no place in her heart for the Jews which happened to have been her own group. Um, and this is galling. It really is. Uh, mm -hmm. Jews are now considered to be only white, which is, of course, hurling an epic curse against you to be called white. Um, 
of Jews, of course, are not white. The uh, Ashkenazic Jews happen to be white. And some of them marry people who are not white. We are not a race. We never were a race. We accept converts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Jews are regarded as rich, which is an old stereotype, mainly anti-Semitic, that was so bad that in the 1920s, a Jewish socialist named Mike Gold actually wrote a famous book called Jews Without Money to make the point that actually there are also poor Jews. Jews are regarded as ipso facto privileged, as if the privileges that many in our community now enjoy were not won by the sweat of their brow, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The left now has a taxonomy of groups and individuals, uh, a taxonomy of victimizations that excludes Jewish history and Jewish experience. And then of course, there is the idea that every Jew walking around is an oppressor of the Palestinians, um, which is insulting in a thousand ways. Uh, and it's insulting before you even get to the question of injustices done to the Palestinians. So the resurgence of anti-Semitism is a test for me of the integrity of progressive Jewish worldviews. And it pains me to note that many progressive Jewish writers who can't stop writing about all of Israel's flaws have yet to devote a piece entirely about the threats that Jews actually face, as if you cannot think both thoughts at the same time as if it's simply impermissible. I remember in 1996, you may recall that there was, or maybe you won't recall, but there were a series of savage bombings of buses in Israel. It was a terrible season of Palestinian terrorism. And I wrote in the New Republic, a number of pieces about those incidents. And some of my left-wing friends said, well, what about the rest of the story? And I said, today, I don't feel like writing about the rest of the story. Right now, there are Jewish body parts in the streets of Tel Aviv. And it must be possible to condemn that without any to be sure sentences. In the same way that it must be possible to oppose policies of the Israeli government towards the Palestinians without any to be sure sentences. So, Instead of, you know, Jews, we're living in a kind of debate. It's, it's a discussion between extenuations of one's preferred um, grievances. And it's not intellectually honest. So I want to I want to ask you a little bit about that, about the sort of the intersectional taxonomy that you refer to. So it seems to me that there are two. Jewish responses, people who are who happen to agree that it's a problem. Um, one is there's this taxonomy of privilege that's being articulated by this ideology, and we Jews belong in it because we really are were oppressed, and our our history of oppression qualifies us for the intersectional club. And another that says the whole problem is that of the is the taxonomy itself, and the taxonomy itself um, is illiberal. And, and we shouldn't try to become a member of good, in good standing of the intersectional club. We should challenge the very idea that this taxonomy exists because it's illiberal and Jews don't do well in the liberal societies. No one does well in the liberal, in the liberal societies. Where, where do you, am I articulating that correctly? And where do you, well, if I so, think, where do you well, come down The idea on that? that Jews don't do well in liberal societies is historical nonsense. No, no, they, no that Jews don't, do, Jews don't do well in illiberal societies. Illiberal I mean, societies. Right. Yes, in course. other words, I'm saying that the taxonomy itself is of problematic course. and we should oppose the taxonomy, not just our, our lack of place in it. But remember, we are surrounded by illiberalisms of all kinds. Um, progressivism can also be an illiberalism. Uh, and just because um, it seems to, that we seem to have some sort of kinship relation with progressivism because our language and our ideals, many of them are descended from the same enlightenment, doesn't mean that 
we don't have enemies to the left. Of course we do. Of course we do. Um, from which I conclude, as I said, that not everything to the left of the right is the same. So that as a liberal, I, ha I have to make arguments with people all around me on all the sides. Uh, I, so I, that, I mean, I think, and it's certainly true that liberalism and not its um, distortions and traductions by radicalism and progressivism and so on, was not only a blessing for Jews in their history, but Jews were some of the most prominent actors in the new liberal societies. We, we kindled to it, we took to it, because we understood that liberalism was an unforeseen lucky break in our, for us in our history. It wasn't just a revolution in, in world history or in Western history, it was also a revolution in Jewish history. Mm. Uh, and it took us a while to figure that out because we also fell for the various Marxisms and socialisms and communisms and so on, but that's a separate conversation. Um, I forgot the beginning of your question. All right, I think we, we hit on it. I have... Um... I have one subject I want to make sure we get to because I've been thinking a lot about it. And I was telling Monica beforehand, if I'm going to have one of the smartest people around on a podcast, I want to be able to ask that person the questions that are, I find most challenging. So, you know, we had elections, obviously, the last week, and those elections um, were at least in part on schools. And, um, and it seems to me that um, one of the issues that we're really fighting about is this uh, is the issue of systemic racism and whether or not it explains what it purports to explain. Yeah. Um, now, I happen to believe that there is systemic racism, although sometimes I'm not, I, I find it hard to sort of defend um, that, you know, the more you look into something, the more you realize, well, maybe there were class-based explanations or there are culture-based explanations that, that could carry the day. But I still believe that there are at least discrete institutions where there's very deeply embedded racism. Um, yet I, I wince when somebody insists that I have to believe that systemic racism explains all of disparity as you see, you know, come out of the Abraham X. Kennedy School and the, and the like. And I'm wondering how you make sense of this question, both in terms of when, when educators and others insist that kids be taught that systemic racism is such an explanation, an all-encompassing explanation, and, and B, what you think of the explanation itself as, a, as one that um, explains disparity in society. I think that um, I'm always deeply suspicious of any explanation that purports to explain everything with one cause and that leaves the individual in some real way without agency. I'm always suspicious of such explanations. There's no question that in institutions in our society and in precincts of our society, there was systemic racism in the, there is systemic racism in the sense that it is pervasive and that there is a tradition of it and that it's deeply entrenched. And so therefore it will require um, enormous exertions of policy and political action and social action to, to uproot. That's certainly, I mean, you have to be a fool not to see that. But if by systemic, if by the word systemic we mean that even if one acts against it, one still is expressing it so that there is really no escape, so that there really is no escape from it. Um, so that if you, you know, that if you don't, if you, if, if, if so that reform and uh, incremental progress and what used to be called in England a hundred years ago, meliorism, um, is simply playing into the hands of this system. Um, I reject that completely. Uh, you know, I first learned about systemic racism uh, naturally in the Jewish context 
when Jabotinsky testified before the Peel Commission in 1936, which you will recall was the commission that produced the idea of partition, which to this day remains the only solution. When Jabotinsky testified before the Peel Commission, he made a very famous or once famous distinction. When explaining his Zionism, he said, there is the anti-Semitism of men and the anti-Semitism of things. It was a very, and he was explaining the grounds of his despair about the prospects for Jews being treated justly in Europe. And when I read it, I was very moved by it because I think that those Zionists who came to believe in systemic anti-Semitism in Europe at that time were right, that their despair was correct and the decision to take matters into their own hands and remove themselves from the jurisdiction of people who could never be trusted to treat them justly made sense. Um, but it raises very interesting questions. Uh, it certainly was not the anti, the sort of prejudice of things or systemic prejudice that, that looked down on individual actions against it. It certainly didn't believe, it certainly was not a prescription of despair. When I read Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, for example, I see fatalism. I see fatalism. It's mm -hmm. always been like that. Brothers and sisters, you have to understand white civilization was built on, on, on our backs. They'll never make let us be free. We can never trust them or anyone but ourselves. Now, I grew up on believing those things about the Jews. And when I grew up, partly because my parents were survivors of the Holocaust, but also because I studied Jewish history. I, everything that I read in Coates's book, if you took out the word black and put in the word Jew, that's what I grew up on. And it took me a while to study and think myself out of that mentality, out of that mentality, that, that a problem is not a fate and that, um, and that pessimism is, offers, has nothing to offer anybody and that the whole world in fact does not wake up every morning, brush their teeth and look for Jews to kill, that that's not the way the world works and that whereas, and that whereas we do have to rely on ourselves we make coalitions with others. We found allies. We found powerful allies. I mean, it's, you know, so this kind of systemic, fatalistic, pessimistic, we're permanently in the grip of this cruel history. And all we can do is remember it and honor our martyrs and maybe take up arms or in some way secede. That can't be the answer, especially because African-Americans are Americans. You know, that they, they debated among themselves for a very long time, the Africanist option, the option of secession, and very wisely, uh, and th they chose against it, which was one of the most moving things that ever happened in American history, because these are people who chose a country and fought for a country that discriminated against them that discriminated against them. Mm. And yet they insisted that they were Americans. Uh, so I think that the analysis of systemic racism has to be complicated by all these considerations without, without ever denying the pervasiveness of racism when it can be shown to be pervasive. I mean, these are empirical questions, right? right. If somebody says that some institution or some person is anti-Semitic, I'm not going to make that my presumption. I'm going to go and check it out. I'm going to go and check it out. The, the, it would be, we could not live as flourishing and internally free American citizens if we walked around with a kind of default setting that everybody we see on the street hates us. And so if somebody is accused of, of anti-Semitism, I need to see some evidence of it. It's not a charge that I throw around lightly because it's a very grave charge. Uh, 
The charge of racism is now being thrown around as lightly as the wind. Uh, I mean, people who are not remotely racist are being called racist. And worse and worse, many people are inhibited from saying what they believe with sincerity and integrity because they fear nothing more than being called a racist. It's amazing how easily it is to silence good people and liberal people by threatening to call them racists. Um, I have been called a racist. I know in my heart that I am not. I took great umbrage at it. I didn't respond publicly because I don't like making those kind of quarrels in public. I know who thinks I'm a racist. I despise them for it. Everything about my life shows that I am not a racist. My conscience is clear on this matter. But um, these are empirical questions. These are historical questions. They're not theoretical questions. And systemic, the, 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 system, the systemic idea, and when you read it developed in the writings of various contemporary black intellectuals, is an attempt to take an empirical question and turn it into high theory of some kind. And the problem mm -hmm. with high theory, as Monica well knows, is that it's unfalsifiable. Yeah. It's unfalsifiable. Right. Monica, so, you have, you have yeah, I, th this leads me to my to my final question, which is about power, right? Because what we're really talking no. about here is is power. Um, the last three lines of your your recent piece, I'm just going to read them. You write, power will always be a challenge challenge to wisdom. Introspection is another name for self rule. Pity the people who need to suppress others to become themselves, pity them and resist them. So the question for me is who has, I mean, I, mean, I think I know the answer, but I'd love to hear you say, who has the power right now? Do you see that power shifting? Because again, if power is always going to be a challenge to wisdom, we need to know who has the power yes. and we need to know if we can transition that power elsewhere. Let's make a distinction between political power and cultural power, that they're related, that they're related. We'll get to their relationship in a minute. There's no question in my mind that you cannot have justice. The only thing that will bring justice into being is political power. That is true, even if Lenin also thought so. Um, you know, the, one of my many complaints against the Obama administration was that in the beginning in 2009, he owned both houses of Congress, the Supreme Court and the White House, and he didn't go for it. And he didn't go for it. In 2004, I, I, when Bush won re-election, he uttered the immortal sentence, the night of the victory, I have political capital and I intend to spend it. it. Hmm. That those are the rules of our game. Those are the rules of our game. The, the, the Democrats under Biden so far appear not to have gotten the memo about that. And they, they, are, they would rather set, gratify themselves ideologically and emotionally, I mean the progressives and the moderates, some of them, than actually seize this opportunity, which is not gonna come often, to use the po actual real political power to, to produce social change, climate change, and so on. Um, so yes, political, and liberals should get over their mild embarrassment about power. They're embarrassed about how powerful Israel is. They're embarrassed about how powerful the United States is. They, know, they feel a little bit queasy about power. Um, you know, the last liberal politician who, who who had no, who was totally at ease with possession of power was Hillary Clinton because she's a creature of power. I used to say about her that one of the reasons I'd vote for her is because if there was a, a need to use some American troops abroad, she would not stay up all night praying to the ghosts of Peter, Paul and Mary to give her permission. <laughs> um, but yes, political power is what it's all about. Our system was designed for that. When the majority has the power, it must not tyrannize over the minority, but it has a mandate. And wasted mandates are, are, are political tragedies 
in in democratic systems, unless, of course, you don't like the mandate. Uh, now, cultural power is a much more diffuse thing. Um, unlike in poly, you can't legislate culture. You can't change it with an election or a bill um, the way you can politics. And the cultural struggle obviously <coughs> has a lot to do, <clears throat> excuse me, with the political struggle <clears throat> even if it would be a big mistake to reduce politics to culture, because they're also raw interests, political interests, economic interests, social interests, and so on. But the cultural struggle has something to do with it. And my view is that the cultural struggle is a much harder and longer struggle. I think it's the work of a generation. I think that um, it's going to take a long time for us to recover our senses, our balance, about certain cultural questions, about the relationship of politics to art, about what the proper way of understanding uh, 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 autonomous experiences are, about the tyranny of politics and ideology, about, uh, well, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, um, about the legitimacy of religion, we have to remember that, you know, progressives and many liberals think that religion is essentially a kind of um, fancified Trumpism, that it's simply the slippery slope to the Iraq war. Um, so th these are fundamental questions about the, about the meaning of life and nothing less. And because that's what culture subject is, the meaning of life. And so this is a long struggle. This really is. And the, the imbecilities that are being rained upon American culture every day, every more, you know, starting at the top with the New York Times, which has become a completely poisonous influence on American culture. Um, these things, it's gonna, it's, it's a real struggle. I mean, anybody who's in it should be, you know, you know, should should pack a lunch because mm -hmm. we're in this for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, a good way to end. Um, it's it, this is not going to be over in two years, um, even if there are, you know, even if the election results tell us that a lot of other people share these concerns. I think that's um, right. I think that's right. So um, thank you very much for for this and for letting us pick your brain. Oh, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Um, With the possible I, I, exception of Institute, there isn't any word in the title of your organization that I don't like. <laughs> uh, so I, so on, on that actually, and we'll, we'll end it, but um, I, I live in the DC area. I, I know you live in DC, in the yeah, DC yeah. still? Yeah. Are you here? So Are I you would, DC? Yeah, yeah, I'm in I'm suburban Maryland, yeah. Oh, I okay. would love, I would love to have coffee and pick your brain about the organization that what we're doing and should be doing where, you know, this is, uh, we've got some very heavy hitters who are helping us uh, flesh this out. And, and I'd love for you to be one of them. Um, oh, I have uh, to, but here's, I've got some advice for you right now. I was just reading today about this um, idiotic university that Barry Weiss. The Austin. Uh, yeah, yeah. University of Austin. University of Austin. I mean, you know, um, but one of the things I noticed about their list and one of the things I noticed about your list, and I'm not here recommending myself, you must put canceled people on it. You right. must put canceled people on it. Yeah. There is no other way to make the point. And that will show that you're serious. Otherwise it will look like, well, we're against cancellation, but what if someone gets offended? You must mm -hmm. do this. You must help to rehabilitate people who are unfairly treated. This is a mitzvah. 